here at Maryville College. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is the Cummings Conversation at Maryville College. I can't see you well enough to know how many students are out there. <laughs> There's a lot of lights out there. Um, but I'm here today to introduce the Reverend Dr. Bill Carl. He has an incredible list of things that he has done in his lifetime. He's a former professor, a seminary president, pa past seminary president, pastor, Greek scholar, novelist, screenwriter, playwright, poet, lyricist, and generalist in neuroscience. Dr. Carl has continued to lecture on the brain at medical schools, medical conferences, and grand rounds for major hospitals since 2000. He's the author of nine books, eight of which are nonfiction, and the latest of which is a fiction, a, a novel based in Maryville, Tennessee. He, it's called Assassin's Manuscript, and he describes it as Dan Brown meets Daniel Silva. He has spoken at Oxford, Princeton, Cornell, Carnegie Mellon, the Chautauqua Institute, and dozens of academic institutions, both in the U.S. and internationally. Would you please welcome Dr. Bill Carl. Thank you, thank you. Are we on? Can you all hear me? Okay, good. How many students do we have here? I want to see a few students. Okay, good. Came to learn how to ace your exams. That's the main reason you're here. Uh, it's a real challenge to speak in any kind of setting at one o'clock in the afternoon. There is an actual physiological thing that happens to you called alkaline tide. And if you have a big lunch and you come in here and it gets kind of dark, and you're very comfortable, I mean, I'm going to have a challenge keeping you awake. I'm going to have to work on it, and I'm going to try, try to make sure this speech is not a cure for insomnia, okay? So I want to share with you today some thoughts I have, some research I've done on using right and left hippocampus in our brains. And uh, I... This really started years ago when I first did this lecture that I gave last night at Aspen. And I'm going to get into telling you about it, but I, I want to preface it uh, with some uh, background, just so you understand where I'm coming from, from the sort of rhetorical, homiletical side. This is rhetoric and homiletics, uh, because I am a homiletician. Uh, homiletics is the art and, pa and practice of preaching, and so someone who is a homiletician is someone who has trained people, is training people in how to preach specifically, but it's also training for, uh, I've trained CEOs and politicians, professors, uh, all different kinds of people, uh, even litigators, so they don't uh, just sit there uh, and stare at their notes in front of the jury. And so uh, I just that, that's a little background. Uh, I remember riding a bus in Pittsburgh, and a woman next to me said, uh, so what do you do for a living? I said, oh, I'm a homiletician. She said, I'm sorry, how long have you had that? <laughs> it sounds like a disease. Um, in 73 to 76, 77, I did my PhD at Pitt. Uh, Ivy League schools don't tend to have graduate programs in rhetoric, so two of the top programs are Pitt and Northwestern. And so I wanted to go where I would be challenged after seminary. And sure enough, I was challenged because I'd grown up in the womb of the church, PK, preacher's kid, then religion, philosophy, and, and Greek a major at University of Tulsa, then seminary in Louisville, not the Baptist one, the Presbyterian one across the street, uh, but I did take courses uh, across the street. And then I go to Pitt, where it's all atheists. And it was a great experience. It, it was a mind-blowing experience for me. I did have one professor who was a recovering Lutheran, and uh, he, he was my uh, professor of presidential rhetoric. 
I just want you to see some of the courses that we studied at Pitt. Traditionally, obviously, classical rhetoric, presidential rhetoric. Uh, Theodore Wendt was one of the top rhetoricians in presidential rhetoric, uh, consultant to all different kinds of politicians. Then we studied the rhetoric of radical movements, whether it's uh, civil rights or black power or the feminist movement, and, and what is the rhetoric like in those movements? How do they whomp up the troops? How do they attack the opponents? It was really fascinating. And we also studied the rhetoric of the sciences and the social sciences, Thomas J. Kuhn's structure of scientific discovery. And then we had a professor named Trevor Melia who had actually had a PhD in physics and a PhD in rhetoric. And he was uh, one of our rhetoric professors who taught a course in mass persuasion that was so popular that in the undergraduate school, it was limited to a thousand students. That there, everyone had wanted to take Trevor Melia's mass persuasion course. And in that course, we studied Billy Graham and Adolf Hitler side by side as examples of mass persuasion. And there were similarities to the way they handled their speeches and their presentations rhetorically. Obviously, the content was totally different, but it was really fascinating uh, to, to study that. So I wanted to just have that as a little bit of background as I share with you this technique that I have developed. And this lecture I'm giving now is, is uh, slightly different, but very similar to one I gave in Malibu. I've done it all over the country and even in Korea and other places. But uh, I gave it in Malibu and it was put online on Vimeo for several years and it got just under 10,000 viewings from all over the world. So a lot of people have seen what I'm going to share with you uh, today. And so I want to talk about, first of all, what it is and what it isn't. Um, the main th reason that we talk about this is that it's important to get passionate about whatever you're going to share with someone else. Um, you, you know, you don't need notes to talk about things you're passionate about, right? I mean, I'm passionate about tennis. I love playing tennis. I'm pretty good. I'm not that great. I'm trying to keep up with my 12-year-old, uh, uh, now soon to be 13-year-old granddaughter who played in a national tournament recently. And, you know, this is a challenge, but I love tennis and I love talking about it. I love talking about how the forehand is, is, is not as natural as the backhand. The backhand is, is a more natural stroke because, you know, you start where your arm doesn't want to be and it moves it just goes home, you know? I love talking about that. And people, you know, I love talking about Greek. You know, I'll talk to anybody about Greek on the bus or on the, on the, uh, on the street. And people say, you need to get a life, you know, talking about Greek that much. But uh, I think it's fun to talk about your grandchildren. How many of you have grandchildren? Let's see, I wanna see, oh yeah. And you probably got pictures on your phone and you got all kind of stuff you can share. You don't need notes to talk about your grandchildren. Alex Haley has a great line. He said to me once, you know, Bill, why grandchildren and grandparents get along so well together? I said, why, Alex? He said, because they have a common enemy. <laughs> think, just think about that for a moment. Okay, so I don't need notes to talk about tennis or Greek or my one grandchild, our one granddaughter, Maggie, and you should think about whatever you're going to present that way. You should get passionate about whatever you're presenting, whether it's a speech or whether it's a Sunday school lesson or whether it's a sermon. You need to get passionate about it. And you need to get in touch with models that have influenced you in your life. Tonight, I'm going to talk a lot about modeling and how important it is and how powerful professors and teachers are and, and parents, obviously, as well, uh, in influencing us, we, we almost become them in some ways. And you want to make sure you're becoming the best of them, obviously. Um, I, I love those progressive commercials. Aren't those a riot? I'm trying to keep them from becoming their parents. Remember those? Oh, man, I'm the guy on the elevator, you know? I'm talking to everybody. I go into restaurants, you know? I go into restaurants and I go around to booths. I go around to tables and I go, is that good? Do you like that? Yeah, I guess, you know? I mean, it's, I don't want to look at a menu. It's called outcomes assessment, right? I want, 
I want to know. And my, my, my family's like, we don't know him. Okay, so now I maybe shouldn't do that so much. It's kind of embarrassing. I'm a little bit too much extrovert. But this modeling is so important. And this is especially true if we just talk about preaching for a moment. I was teaching at Pitt when I was doing my PhD back in the early 70s. And in 1975, 76, a couple of homileticians, one retired, one left, one went on sabbatical. So they needed me to teach as an instructor. So I did. I'll, I'm working on my PhD. That's great. And I'd taught at Pitt already. So I, I was ready. Let's do it. And I had a woman in my class who had been a missionary to China, uh, excuse me, to Egypt. She'd been a missionary to Egypt. She had taught English at Syracuse University, and she had been uh, the dean of students at Syracuse University. And she had now come to Pittsburgh Seminary, uh, and she was in my preaching class. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to say her name because this is being live stream, and I don't want to embarrass her, but... Uh, Jane remembers her, and she's an amazing woman. So I passed out the uh, syllabus, and then I told them what they were going to have to do for their first outline, and I'd want to see the first outline for the first sermon the next week. And uh, this woman came to me. She was a little bit older than I, and uh, she said, could I talk to you? And I go, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let's see, I think they gave me a little office kind of in a corner under, near a broom closet, so, you know, I'm just an instructor. Oh, yeah, okay, so I come in, and uh, we sit down to talk, and she starts crying, and I said, what, wait, this is, you know, it's like League of Your Own. There's no crying in baseball, you know, there's no, there's no crying in homiletics. What, what, are you, what are you crying about? I don't even have any tissue here. And she goes, I can't do my first outline. I said, What? And I had heard about her. I knew she'd taught English. I knew she'd been a professor. I knew she'd been a dean of students. I said, what do you mean you can't do your first outline? She said, I've never seen a woman preach. And the earth kind of moved for me at that moment. I, I, I thought the power of modeling is so, so important. So you want to get in touch with your model. So I, you know, I started finding places for her to go hear someone who was female who was preaching. And from that moment on, when I went on to teach at Union Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, and everywhere else I've lectured at Princeton and Columbia and, you know, Oxford, wherever, I've always said to women, you have permission to stand in that pulpit. Never think that you do not. You want to get in touch with your models, uh, and um, you want to find your own voice. So often we try to imitate whoever it is, Barbara Brown Taylor, or Fred Craddock, or you know, Colin Powell, whoever it is. Colin Powell's one of the greatest speakers I've ever heard. I don't know if you've ever heard Colin Powell. Oh my gosh. I mean, no notes, nails it every single time. Unbelievable. But you can't be Colin Powell. You can't be these other people that you want to be. You need to be yourself. You need to find your own voice. Um, it was Phillips Brooks uh, who wrote O Little Town of Bethlehem, they're up in Boston, who said, preaching is truth speaking through personality. It's through your personality and actually trusting that you can. Now, I'm just going to tell you also what this technique is not, and it is not a way to put your focus on yourself. So you have given a speech or a sermon, and you use no notes, whether you stood out in front or you stood at a podium or whatever, and people are leaving, they're going, wow, wasn't that incredible? Yeah, did you see how she didn't use any notes? Yeah, it was amazing. What'd she say? I don't know. You see, you, you're missing the point because it's not to be a focus on you. It's not a way to get more praise. It's to get out of the way. And it is to point to the one you're trying to connect people with. Uh, Corey Tin Boom, you know, lived through the Holocaust and was interviewed once. She said, they said, the microphone in her face and said, 
So there have been movies about you and books. And how is it you can remain so humble? And she said, well, do you remember uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you remember how they uh, threw down their garments? Yeah, and they waved the palm branches. Yeah, and they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. Yeah, I remember that. She said, well, do you think for a moment that the donkey thought any of that was for him? Think of that for a moment. That's all we are. I guess it gives a new, new uh, s twist on uh, Balaam's ass story, whatever. But, but the point I'm making is we are just, as preachers, we're just Christ bearers. That's what the name Christopher means, the one who bears Christ. Um, we are, I like to use the term ushers when I talk about this, because one of the greatest honors for any clergy is to usher someone into the presence of the Almighty, to get that call that so-and-so is dying, and they're kind of waiting for you to come pray them into heaven. You may have had a loved one that way. I don't know. But I'm telling you, it is a very powerful thing. I think I preach to over half a million every third Sunday on TV, on a major ABC network. I've preached to 10,000 in Korea. Uh, I've preached to 5,000 at Chautauqua. But it is not, those are not as much an honor as getting to hold somebody's hand and pray that person into heaven. We are like ushers at the theater. We are simply, uh, like in a great opera, we are simply passing out the program and ushering someone into the presence of the great spectacle that is going to happen on the stage. We are not the point. We are trying to help people see what the point is. So when we present, we're just ushers for people into the truth we are trying to share, whether it's a sermon or a political speech or whatever it is. And it's, it's not thinking about how we are doing. I'm going to talk a little more about that at the very end because there's a different, there's, there are some really creative ways to find out what's actually happening out there. And um, it, it's not really about how you're performing. Uh, I love using the phrase, the Holy Spirit, for those of us who preach. There are times when you give a sermon and you just think, boy, that was a dud. I just don't know. I, did, I had two funerals this week. I, can't, I, I just couldn't get it out. I just did the best I could. And someone will shake your hand and go, that touched me so deeply. You connected me to God today. And I go, how in the heck did that happen? Because you didn't feel like it went very well at all. You know? And so, so it's the Holy Spirit theologically. The Holy Spirit finishes our sentences uh, with sighs, interprets for us with sighs too deep for words. So I'm preaching in Taiwan back in, I think it was 1986, and I went up into the, the mountain district uh, where uh, some of the most uh, indigenous people live, and you know, the languages are so different there. You've got Mandarin, you've got Taiwanese. Mandarin has four tones, Taiwanese. Uh, Hakka has six tones, Taiwanese has eight tones. And you're trying to, you, you say something with the wrong tone, you say something bad about somebody's grandmother. You know, you have to be very careful. And it's important to be able to speak correctly. So I'm getting translated and I get up to preach and there are three of us in the pulpit. So I'm, you know, and I look out, by the way, and I see people with really interesting tattoos. And I said, what is the deal with the tattoos? He says, oh, those are all former headhunters. I go, whoa, what happened to, how, they said, oh, all the former headhunters have become Presbyterians. Okay, <laughs> whatever. You know, this is Taiwan, right? So, um, so I'm going to go and I'm going to preach, but I'm going to go for a few sentences and then uh, a former student of mine, who was now a missionary in Taiwan, is going to translate from, from my English to Mandarin Chinese, and then a little mountain preacher is going to go in mountain dialect. So I'd go for a few sentences, and he'd go for a few sentences in Mandarin, and he'd go for a few sentences in mountain dialect. By the time it got back to me, I forgot where I was, you know. 
And at one point, the little mountain preacher just took off. He's just preaching up a storm. The other two of us are standing there just kind of looking at him like, what the heck is going on? And everybody's really responding and all this. And I finally said, what? Ask him. He, he, he said, oh, he, he, he told me that he didn't think you were doing very well and just decided to preach it himself. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit who finishes our sentences when we don't do uh, a very good job. So, uh, a couple other quotes from ancient, you know, classical rhetoric, and from the Apostle Paul, two different ways of looking at power. Um, Cicero is right, and it's still true today, those who speak well have power. And Paul's also right, God's power is made perfect in our weakness. So uh, I just want you to have those in mind. Now, when you go to present of any kind, you're going to have stage fright. I had an amazing piano teacher, had nine years of piano in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And uh, I still, you know, I talked last night about the old factory bulbs and how Smell is so powerful with our memories. If I walk into the Women's Foundation uh, building in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, the smell of that will terrify me because that's where all our recitals occurred, right? And it's so powerful. And, and my piano teacher studied with the same person with whom Van Cliburn studied. She was brilliant. She, she was challenging. She, she worked us hard. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But she taught me about stage fright. And she said, if you don't have it, you don't belong up there performing. You need to have some, because that gives you an edge, you know, a little, you know, a little edge. It's very natural. She said there are two kinds of stage fright. There's nervousness and there's excitement. She said you're nervous when you're not prepared and you have a right to be nervous because you are not prepared. And then she said, and then excitement is you're excited, and when you're excited, you're prepared, and you just get the butterflies to fly in formation. That's the way she put it. I've always thought about that. I've always remembered that. And so, preparation. I uh, had a friend who went to law school, good lawyer, and he said his law school professor said, Preparation, not possession, is nine-tenths of the law. So preparation is what's crucial. Also organization, I have taught this technique to people all over the country, and when they want to learn it, I'll say, send me your sermon, and I'll look at it, or send me your speech, and I'm going to show you the format that I use that helps you be able to learn it more quickly. And, they'll, and I'll put it into that format, and then I'll start reading the sermon or speech, and I will say, you know, I couldn't learn this sermon. And they go, why? I said, because it's a mess. It's meandering in the swamp. It doesn't have any structure to it. It doesn't flow logically or have a theologic to it. There's no, I couldn't learn this sermon. So you've got to have a good structure. You have to have a good, simple outline because if it's going to be hard for you to learn, it's going to be hard for them to hear. Uh, symbolo is just the Greek word that is used when Mary pondered all these things in her heart. Uh, at the end of uh, that wonderful uh, story uh, about the birth of Jesus um, in uh, Luke 2, uh, she's pondering, she's putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And uh, I've had students say to me, you know, when you say memorize, it scares us even more. Uh, and I say, okay, I understand that. It's, it's just say internalize. Well, I, that's fine. Now, I actually memorize word for word, uh, but I also sometimes just internalize. Here's another technique that uh, my piano teacher taught me, which is memorize backwards. And the way that works is you start at the last measure of the piece and you memorize that. And you play it through to the end without looking at the manuscript. Then you go, uh, the, the, the score, the music. And the, then you go to the, the measure before that, you memorize that, you play through to the end. You keep going until you get to the beginning of the piece and you play through to the end 
but you can do it because you know the end better than you do the beginning. So it gets easier and easier the farther you go. Do you see how that makes sense? It's, it's so much easier that way. And I teach people the same thing if you're going to speak, right? You must be able to go backwards like that. And when you can, and the truth is the way you end is much more important than the way you begin. That's what people remember is the way you end. Um, and by the way, she is also the one who said to me and probably helping me understand way before when I was just a little kid that we have billions of neurons bouncing in our brain and we can do way more than we can, I would think we can. She's the one who said to me, I never want to hear the word can't come out of your mouth. Because if I do, I will stop teaching you. Now, people really wanted to study with her, and you had to bring in every lesson, the sheet that was signed by your parents that you had practiced at least an hour a day, every day. Because if you didn't, she wouldn't, she wouldn't teach you anymore. She's also the one that taught me that um, if you can play for the tape recorder and listen to it and all that, then the recital itself will be easier because the tape recorder remembers every tiny little error you make, but the people won't, the audience won't. So she pushed you that way, and it was really helpful. Now, all of this technique I'm going to teach you begins in what I showed you last night. There's what it looks like. It's right there inside your head. Kind of ugly, but that's it. It's the size of a coconut, the shape of a walnut, the consistency of chilled butter. And as we talked about last night, we have all these different lobes and sections that have different jobs. Um, I mentioned last night uh, having my sight totally gone uh, on the tennis court and being taken. Jane took me to the ophthalmologist and uh, it was the receptionist who said, try some Coke, and I did. And, and uh, you know, I, like I said last night, I wanted to pay the receptionist because we didn't have to, uh, have to go see the ophthalmologist. But I did find out, and I didn't mention it last night, that what my condition was, was an occipital migraine. It's called an occipital migraine. If you haven't had enough food uh, and you exercise too much, you can have all your vision go away and that's what had happened to me. So just a reminder, uh, as that little video I showed last night, you have 100 billion neurons bouncing in your head right now. Think about that for a moment. 100 billion neur neurons making trillions of synaptic connections. As I said last night, there are more synaptic connections going on in your brain than there are, than there are stars in the universe. Well, that means you can do almost anything you want. Anything you try. Oh, I don't know if I can study for this exam. I know it's pretty hard. Now, I have to tell you how I studied for exams for the students who are here. When I was in college at University of Tulsa, because I wanted to make sure I did as well as I could, I would imagine the exam was going to be the next day, even though it was four days away. So I did the cramming that night for the exam, that it, my bogus exam that was going to be the next day, but it wasn't. It was going to be three days. Then that night I would cram like I was going to. And I, so by the day before, the night before, I was really prepared. You have to start earlier. Remember, inspiration is 90% perspiration. It's working it, working it. Uh, I mentioned also the Broca's area last night, which is this section right here, which is the speech center of the brain. It's actually in the frontal lobe, which is kind of interesting, and the Wernicke's area. Remember, the Wernicke's area is where you're understanding and comprehending what I am, I am saying to you. And if you want to make a comment, by the way, we're going to have questions and answer after this one because I'm not signing any books after this one. If you are beginning to want to say something, you're going to use, oh, sorry, you're going to use the Broca's area, which is right here. And I mentioned about the woman in my congregation, and we talked about this, this King's Speech, and, uh, and, and I didn't mention that in the movie, The King's Speech, uh, Jeffrey Rush plays the uh, Lionel Logue, the uh, 
person who helps him, the speech pathologist, and he plays music. Remember, he plays music because music will help people overcome a stroke. Uh, and it's very powerful. I use that same thing with the woman in my congregation. But the other thing I wanted to tell you about the bro Brocus area is uh, something that happens there that all the cognitive neuroscientists talk about is the reason for the terrible twos. Did you know that? It's very interesting. Um, so the Brocus area um, does not really begin to develop more until you're three. The Wernicke's area develops before the Brocus area, so children are understanding what we're saying to them and they're, and they're trying to figure out what they want to say and they get all frustrated and they get, just get mad. That's the whole reason for the terrible twos. And you just pray for them to turn three, you know. Please go ahead and turn three. Okay, now we talked last night about the hippocampus uh, coming from two Greek words, hippos meaning horse and compass meaning sea. So it looks like a seahorse and and uh, when you see it in, in a, a brain, that's what it looks like. And we talked about London cabbies and how they have the most highly developed right hippocampus of any people in the world. Uh, University of College uh, neurologists in London uh, have studied them for years and they still don't use a GPS system. Now, someone mentioned last night, I think it was Bill Meyer or somebody uh, or something I heard also, and you've probably heard it too, that using a G GPS system is not good for your brain. Did you know that? Because if you use a map and you start working on where you're going, it's actually better for your brain. Now, I have to tell you who cheered when she heard that. It was my wife, Jane, because Jane is old school. Maps, let's get the map out, and, I'll, and we'll do the GPS, and it's got a lady's voice, British voice or whatever. And, and then here will be the question. Are you going to listen to your lady? Or are you going to listen to me with my map? That's a very, you've got to be very careful how you answer that question. <laughs> oh, Jane, I'll listen to you with your map. Yeah. Well, now she's got evidence that it actually doesn't help you to use the G GPS. All right. We talked about the amygdala last night, but here's right there, this green piece right here. That is the... Uh, hippocampus and that is what we're going to use with this brain technique uh, mag uh, cam hippocampus neurons magnified many many times all right I learned this technique from Michael Gazzaniga who was at Hart uh, uh, Dartmouth Hitch Hitchcock Medical Center at the time he and I both lectured at Aspen by the way I uh, ran into him again a few years later, both of us were lecturing at Chautauqua Institution, and it was fun to reconnect with him, and I reminding him of, of, of what he had lectured on and how I had developed this technique, and he was really interested. Uh, what he told us in his lecture was that if you have a stroke on the right or the left side that affects your right hippocampus or left hippocampus, uh, when you look at um, a picture or a, f a face or an image or whatever, you won't remember who that person is because the stroke has affected your right hippocampus, the memory in your right hippocampus. If it happens on the left side, which is verbal memory, uh, you'll lose names, you'll lose, you lose lots of things that you had that are verbal. So I just, all I did from hearing him lecture like that was just to reverse what he said take a negative and turn it into a positive. So if you look at, if you're looking at eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, there's an imaginary dotted line down the middle, and I'm gonna turn this way so you can see, your right brain is seeing the left half of the page, your left brain is seeing the right half of the page. You don't know that because your brain is putting it all together, but because left hippocampus is verbal memory and right hippocampus is visual memory, if you want to remember those three paragraphs on that page that you're studying for school or that you're going to give as a speech or a sermon, then you want to put a word on that side of the page. Left hippocampus is for the right side of the page. You want to put a word uh, that will summarize for you or help you remember that paragraph as you're learning it. And you want to put a, a funny cartoon picture on this side 
that may not be the same as the word, but it brings that paragraph to life for you. And I learned the hard way, even though I'm going to use clip art with these presenta this presentation today, don't use clip art on a sermon or a speech or a lecture that you're going to give as a professor because it won't sink in your memory as much as the visceral experience of drawing, drawing your own cartoon picture. All right, so I want you to understand the left and the right hippocampus as we get into this. So let's imagine you've got this really great presentation. It's a lecture, it's a speech, or whatever. And you've got these, uh, these paragraphs, and you're trying to learn them. So you, you put a, a word on the right side, because that's your a verbal hippocampus, the red, left hippocampus, and you put a picture on, on, on the left side. Um, now, I've used a clip art here, and I've to I'm going to use it again. But I don't know if you've noticed, but even in the lecture I gave last night, and this is a note to professors, if you're going to use PowerPoint, and by the way, I like the line, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts it absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a good line because uh, we overuse it. But if you're going to use it, always have the words on the right side and the pictures on the left. If you're not doing that now, start doing it because you're working against people's brains remembering your lecture if you put the pictures over on the right side and the words on the left. So uh, just keep noticing as I go even through the presentation tonight um, how I did that. Now, I'm going to show you how I'm going to do this with a speech, a famous speech, and uh, then I want to give you some background on how you test what's coming through. Um, I really think it's important not only to read great books that are classical literature, I mean, all the great books, it's really important to do that. For our own education, no matter how old or young we are, and you never stop learning. I mean, I'll be 75 in October, and, and by the way, I call that the, uh, part of the new middle age. Did you know that? The new middle age now is 60 to 90. Did you all know that? No, that's the new middle age, really. I've spoken at Chautauqua a few times, and uh, yeah, I call Chautauqua the Disney World for the chronologically mature, uh, because you are dodging scooters and walkers and some really, really bright people who are really well read. Uh, but you cannot get the senior citizen discount at Chautauqua until you're 90. Did you know that? You have to be 90 to get the senior. So the new middle age is 60 to 90. So here I am in October. I'll be halfway through the new middle age, and I am not going to stop learning. I'm retired, but I'm going to keep on learning. And, it, it, and, and part of learning is reading great literature, but it's also reading great speeches. Uh, this is just my little short list of some great speeches that if you've never looked them up, and you can find them on Google or read them, uh, Pericles Funeral Oration, the end of the First Peloponnesian War. It's brilliant. It's a classic. Uh, the great St. Crispin's Day speech in Shakespeare's Henry V. Classic. Uh, we brave, we few, we band of brothers. It's brilliant. Um, and for uh, Queen Elizabeth I, I was just sharing with uh, a couple of folks on the staff here. Um, this is a, an amazingly brilliant speech. It's a speech at Tilbury to the troops, the English troops, to, de to, to try to defeat the Spanish Armada that's about to take over England. And she just goes all out. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's kind of one, probably one of the very first really uh, feminist manifestos, 1588. And this is just one tiny phrase toward the end. She, she defends her strength as a female leader saying, I know I have the body but of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and the stomach of a king, the king of England. And she so inspired her English troops that they, they went out and defeated the uh, Spanish Armada. A, a Virginia Woolf's in 1928, another feminist manifesto, A Room of One's Own. You always have to include kings. I mean, just go back and read I Have a Dream. It's, it's unbelievably, it's very prophetic in the sense of Second Isaiah, Isaiah 40, uh, but it's also incredibly visionary as a prophetic speech. Um, and then uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, 
speech to the Houston Ministerial Association that was really used as um, a way to turn the tide in the election. Uh, and the reason he gave this speech was that Norman Vincent Peale had put out pamphlets all over. This is way before internet, way before social media. He put out pamphlets all over that said, we don't want the Pope running the White House. He never elected a Catholic. We don't, no, 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 not that. So Kennedy knew he had to address this and that one of the most conservative places to go was the Houston Ministerial Association. And so he set up to go down there and hear all these pastors from all over Houston, right? And he talks about religious freedom and how important that we have, our forefathers fought for it and died for it. Uh, and he says, and also, when they fought at the shrine I visited today, the Alamo, for side by side with Bowie and Crockett died McCafferty and Bailey and Carey, but no one knows whether they were Catholic or not, for there was no religious test at the Alamo. And the inference is there shouldn't be one for the presidency. It is an absolutely brilliant speech. In, in rhetoric classes, we used it as an example for dealing with an opponent and getting that opponent to change the, his or her mind, mind about whatever it is they were dealing with. These are great speeches. Of course, the Gettysburg Address is a classic. 270 words, debates about when Lincoln actually wrote it. He actually wrote it earlier, some say on the train, on the way, on the back of an envelope. That's probably not correct. It's probably apocalyptic, I mean ap apocryphal, excuse me. And uh, it was an apocalyptic time, obviously, with the Civil War. But it is an unbelievably brilliant speech. And I'm going to show you how, if I were going to memorize, it's only 270 words. Remember, speaking time is 100 words per minute. So 270 words, if you write 270 words, you're going to be speaking about two and a half minutes. You ought to be able to learn that, right? Well, this looks pretty tight. I mean, this is so tightly written, so brilliant. It's, uh, it's probably a little bit hard for you to read because it's so small up there, but I, I'm going to show you how I would reformat it if I were going to learn the Gettysburg Address. Another point to remember is Edward Everett, who was a major uh, famous orator, was the speaker for that day. And they just sort of at the last minute asked the president to come and make a few remarks also. Well, Everett, Edward Everett went for two hours. And it's a great speech and all, but I mean, two hours? You know? No wonder Jesus had to feed the 5,000. He's probably preaching a little too long that day or something. Their stomachs were grumbling. But Edward Everett's speech, no one remembers it. Lincoln's is the one we remember because of how crucial it was, it, it was a turning point of the war. Remember, it's a turning, the battle itself is a turning point of the war. Um, the, the, killer, the book, The Killer Angels, talks about this, how it's about paradigm shifts, how, how uh, Lee wanted to continue to fight the same way, line up all the troops like a European battle, and Longstreet said, no, these guys, these, these Yankees are picking us off from up in the trees and the, the, the guerrilla warfare. They didn't use that term, but that's, he says, we can't keep fighting the same way. And Lee didn't listen to him. And that was the turning point of the war. There was a paradigm shift going on in, in battlefields and Lee didn't buy into it. So here comes Lincoln to give this incredible speech. And that's what it looks like in his handwriting. This is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in his handwriting. And I want you to notice that um, he's, he's done better than I did. He's got at least three paragraphs. This third one's going to be the longest one to learn. It's a big chunk. It's going to be a long one to memorize. I have no idea whether he gave it with no notes or not. Probably not. It's all right. He's Lincoln. He can do whatever the heck he wants, right? Okay, so we're going to blank the screen for a second, and I am going to hop out of this, and I'm going to pull up a couple of things to show you, and then, and now you can bring it back up, and then I am going to show you this technique with Gettysburg Address. Uh, 
it doesn't matter whether you can read all the words or not. Um, I'm, what I want to show you is that instead of, of learning whatever it is you're going to present on eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, learn it the way we learn when we've read books our whole lives, you know? Uh, before I went to just no notes, I had a little sermon book like this or lecture book, and I went to the way it looks in a book. It's half page, right? This kind of format, right? And this, if you turn, I would have on the back and another page here. That's a whole 20-minute sermon right there, and you're only touching paper once. Whereas if you've got eight and a half by 11, what you're doing is you've got probably six, seven or eight pages up there, and it's, it's double-spaced. And I guarantee the, the young people in the balcony are counting. You, oh, she's almost on page seven. Yes, we're getting close. No, you don't want to be touching a lot of paper when you're, when you're lecturing or speaking. Uh, this is more what my sermons or lectures look like right now. And you can't see it from there, but I've got circles. I circle the verbs. The verbs are what drive. The, when you take a rapid reading course, you learn how to find the verbs because that's what drives the sentence. And I circle the verbs, and I have different colors. And I'm going to put words on the right and pictures on the left. Now, uh, this, is a, this is a sermon I did called, Are You As Good As You Think You Are? And I start with this whole thing of people coming to my office, and they'll say, um, so uh, I'll say, you want some coffee? No, I'm good. And I go, I didn't ask about your moral status, you know. What, do you need the restroom? No, I'm good. What does that got to do with relieving yourself? We use this phrase, I'm good, all the time. It's all good, whatever, whatever. So uh, this was a message on the rich man and how he wanted to understand what he was supposed to do and to get eternal life. And so I've got these phrases, I'm good, it's all good, good deeds. He thought good deeds would get him there. And so those, the word good is going to be the word I'm going to put on the right side of this page to learn these two paragraphs. I've got, I've got, I'm good, it's all good, uh, good deeds, um, a story about uh, uh, the preacher said, uh, Any, uh, anybody who's ready to go to heaven, please stand up. And everybody stood up except one guy. He said, well, you don't want to go to heaven? He said, yeah, sure I do. I thought you were getting up a group right now, you know. Uh, no, so, you know, getting up a group, you see how the good um when you give a eulogy and people, uh, our pastors had to do a lot of funerals recently, and you do a eulogy and people come up and go, wow, that was so wonderful. And I said, well, you know, I have good material to work with, the person's life. And the reality is you write your own eulogy with the way you live your life, right? And so uh, that's kind of a sobering thought in a way. I see some students have got a good class. Have a good class. Take care, guys. Okay, so uh, I also say uh, with the eulogy, be real nice to your pastor and your fan, friends and your family because they're going to have the last word, right? Okay, now I am going to move to showing you this in the Gettysburg Address. Okay, this is how if you were just trying to learn it, that's it. That's what it would look like, right? And then if you put it on half pages, it gets a little bit easier. There it is. And if you put it, you can see without italicizing, without, you know, underlining, whatever, whatever. So what you're trying to do is take material you're trying to learn and breaking it down in smaller chunks and figure out ways that you can use words and pictures to bring it to life. That's what you're trying to do. Okay, we're going to blank the screen again. I'm going to get out of this and back into where we were. Oh, I jumped to the beginning. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, just hang on. I'll come right up back to where we were. Okay, so I, now you can come back up. So I took the Gettysburg Address, and on PowerPoint, you can't really make it the half 
page like I tried to show you just a minute ago. But I've used colors, because I always use colors, and I've got some pictures, and um, the pictures are, you know, to the, to the left there, because that's where my right hippocampus wants to see things. And then I've taken those words that are going to be key words that I'm going to write over on the right side of the page, and I've just shown you what they are. There's some F words and B words. Um, you could also use dedicated because this whole thing is a dedication, but if you use dedicate, 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 you're, it's not going to sink in your memory because it's not distinct enough. So at four score in seven years, a father's brought forth da 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 with a battlefield. Okay, so they've got B words and F words. And then second paragraph, final resting place, fitting and proper. I've got a, a gravestone over on the left. Uh, but far above our poor power to add or detract, can never forget what they did. The brave men, yada, yada, yada. Picture of brave men. For us, the living, the for us, that's the F word, the last full measure of devotion, a new birth of freedom. So if I were going to learn the Gettysburg Address, uh, which I don't think is that easy to learn, even though it's going to only be two and a half minutes, I've got to, I've got to break it down, and I've got to figure out ways to bring it to life in my mind. And then, and let's say whether it's this or it's some other presentation you're going to, uh, you're going to work on, and by the way, this is a summary of what I've been saying to you today, right? One who speaks well has power, got Cicero, overcoming greatest fear, preparation and memorization, brain, hippocampus right, left, famous speech is Gettysburg. Okay, look down the right side of the page. If I were going to say, I want to remember what I've been saying in this presentation today, I have words that start with an S sound. So I've got Cicero, stage, start, cerebral, and speeches. And I would memorize that order of words. I just memorize them. And every time I said one of them, it would bring up that paragraph or that section of the presentation. Um, th th it's, it's really, really important to understand. Okay, and I'm going to come to a final slide here in a second. But I want to say, when I would work on this, I mean, the first time I tried it, it was Christmas Eve, huge crowds, crazy time to try it. The meditation was a little bit shorter, thankfully. Uh, but I left, I, I, I left, actually I put it under the pulpit so I could, I could pull it out if I, if I needed to. But I didn't need to, and it was scary as you know what. I mean, you're on a tightrope, and you're over the Niagara Falls, and there's no net. But when you do it, and you get all the way through it, it's the most exhilarating feeling you've ever had. Again, you're not doing it for yourself, not doing it to make a big deal of you, it's to get the message better to other people. And that facial communication, as I talked about last night, communication is only 10% verbal, the words we say. I don't like that, but it's what it is because I've spent a lot of time getting my words in the correct order. It's only 20% it's only visual, that's body language, and it's 70% facial. I'll talk about this again tonight in relationship to communicating with children and babies. Uh, but... I would, I would just start, start working on it. Uh, I always finished a sermon by noon on Friday, then go do something else. Go play tennis, go, go visit somebody in the hospital, whatever. And then Saturday morning I'd start learning. And I'd already be doing pictures and words and I'm doing colors. I use colors. Uh, you can use your own colors. Pink is for grace and mercy. And blue is the blues, so it's evil and suffering. And green is, can be money or it can be mission. Uh, yellow is joy. Orange is sort of neutral. And it's amazing how powerful colors are in bringing a text to life for you that I just, you, you just see words otherwise. So I would get it done and then I would take a walk in the neighborhood. And my neighbors all knew I was kind of crazy because I'd be giving the sermon to the trees and birds and everything. And um, then all of a sudden, I realized I didn't remember a part. So I'd have to go back to the house because I'd left it. So, but when you can take a walk and give the whole thing with all the noises and everything, ah, oh, you're getting close. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then sometimes we would go to a Saturday night event. We didn't do that very often, obviously. And um, I would drive, and I'd, Jane have a copy of the sermon. And I, uh, I'd say, go ahead and ask me questions. She'd say, what's the third word on the second page? And, and if I could, and, and, and what's, the, what's the second picture on the third page? And uh, give me the pictures uh, backwards on the top of all the pages. And if I could begin to do that, now it's cross-texturing and now it's beginning. Now I go, go home and I lie in bed and w w what you go over before you go to sleep is going to sink in. And I, I do it real fast. You know. Sometimes take a shower and do it real fast. I mean, obviously you can't carry it in with you and so... By the time I get to church on Sunday morning, man, I can hardly wait. It's, it's there. I'm ready. Let's go. Do you notice how much preparation I had to do? I had to make sure the outline was clear and, and the illustrative material. Now, if I come to a place while I'm going over it and I go, I got stuck here. It's just not, I can't remember the next part. I go back and look at it and I go, oh, the language went flat. Shh, shh, big X through that paragraph. It was just gone. Because if it's going to be hard for me to remember, it's going to be hard to hear. And I'll, I'll, I'll prove that to you in this last slide. I know we've gone a little over time. Hang with me. Uh, we're almost through. Um, yeah, I said last night, people hear what they want to hear, and, and we gave an illustration of that. Um, I used three different kinds of critiques when I critique sermons in a class. The first is a more traditional one where... Um, so-and-so just preached, and I will ask that person, what did you like about what you just did? I'm going to start with a positive. So important to start with positives, not cut people apart. And it's important for the person who just preached to know something positive about how uh, they felt about it. And then I'll say to the class, what did you like about it? So we all, everything's positive. After you've made a presentation, the first thing you need is a hug, not cut, 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 right? Then I will say to the person, what do you think you could have done a little better? It's very important for that person to know how to identify that because once you graduate from seminary, you're not going to have a class doing this for you. Well, I just, you know, I really messed up on this and that and on, and they go on and on. And then I'll ask the class, what do you think they could have done a little better? And they'll go, well, yeah, it wasn't that bad. And they'll go, it was bad, but it wasn't that bad. You know? And uh, I had a student who's now in Florida at a big church, and he called that a stroke and a poke. You know, I mean, it's like positive. And even the second part is put in a positive way because the goal is to say, how can we help this person be an even better preacher than she already is? I always use that in evaluations yeah, as a supervisor as well, as well. I will always start with the positive. What do you think you're doing well? Here, I agree with you. That, I think you're doing that well. What do you think you could do a little better? Yeah, I agree with that. And all of a sudden, there's more ownership in that. Okay, that's the traditional way. Then we had the person on the street approach where I would say, I can see Karen down here. So I'd say, Karen, Dan's going to preach, and I would like for you to go get a cup of coffee, and you're going to come back and help me with the critique. Okay, ready? Go get a cup of coffee. I don't mean right now, but you, you, you go get a cup of coffee. And Dan preaches. And uh, the students are not to take any notes. They are ready for you to come back. They don't even know you're going to do this until we tell them. And you come back, and you get up to the whiteboard or blackboard, whatever we got, and you say to the class, what's the first thing you heard? Well, they're all like, yeah, collectively. They're to come up with whatever the opening illustration was. Okay, so they, all right. And if it wasn't that good, they will not remember it. It was as if it hadn't been said. Okay, what was the, what was the first part? Oh, that first point was da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and then there was that illustration about so-and-so, and then, hmm, what was next? You're asking them, and there's a blank. Well, there was that other illustration about so-and-so. Well, that's down in the third point. What was next? And they had just heard this presentation, but they couldn't remember what was in that second part. 
So I'm sitting with the student and we're looking at the text and I'm saying, look, look where your language went flat here. Look where you didn't bring it to life. You didn't bring that text to life here in a very interesting way. And so it, it's as if you hadn't said it. And it's proof right there. There's a real test and we can see that it didn't come through. I've done this enough that I can look at a sermon, a, le a speech, any kind of presentation, and I, and I can predict they're not going to hear that part. Just, it's just not going to happen. Now, the third kind is the, that, I call that the person on the street critique, where you just pull somebody in off the street. That's what Karen was doing. She just came in off the street and started asking them, what'd you hear? And it's a great way to find out. You can take a group of people in a congregation, if you're a pastor, to go have a cup of coffee and have a conversation about what did you hear and do a little recording of it. And you can listen to it and you see what actually came through. But this third one is almost more powerful. And I stumbled across it uh, teaching at Austin. I think it was after I left Union. And I've done it in Princeton and Columbia, lots of different places. Uh, did it for sure at Pittsburgh. And this is the faith and personal growth critique. And this is where you begin to say, what's happening up here with me as the preacher is not really what's important. What's happening, or the speaker, the lecturer, the professor, whatever, that's not what's important. What's happening is out there in the faith consciousness or the intellectual consciousness of the audience, the class, or the congregation. That's what's really important. So instead of talking about how good the sermon was or what they heard, what they didn't hear. Now I'm sitting with a student over on the side and the conversation is about where this sermon touched them in terms of their own faith. What part really meant an enormous amount to them in terms of their own faith? And now we're getting to real pay dirt. Now we're getting to what's really coming through and literally making a difference, not just intellectually, but emotionally and spiritually as well. And so I will sit with the student, and the class is, again, not to take any notes. They're just going to pretend they're a congregation, and they start talking. And we just sit over. We don't say anything. The student and I don't say anything. But we have a copy of the manuscript. And every time they name, you know that story about that boy with his mother... God, that just, that's just so powerful. We put a check mark next to that. That point, that, that theological point that she made about da 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 check mark. Now you're beginning to sense what's really coming through. And you can do the same thing with a small group. I've done this when I've coached pastors around the country. Gather a small group, tell them you're going to provide some refreshment and some muffins, and just let them go in a room. You aren't there. They got a tape recorder. They talk about where that sermon touched them in terms of their own faith. You can do it with a group of students if you're a professor. Uh, not so much about faith always, but just about what actually influenced you from that lecture that you heard today. Uh, and, and have them talk, and then you listen to it later. And you're beginning to sense what's really happening because what's really important is not how am I doing up here as the lecturer, preacher, you know, politician, whatever it is, CEO in front of a whole corporate group, it's what's happening out there. That's what's really important. And that's why we do the very best we can to learn as much of our presentation as we, we can. So you got to be ready. I mean, you have, I had, I've had people faint in the middle of it, and you've got to figure out what to do. I mean, I, I was preaching in a Salem Camp Meeting in Covington, Georgia, which is the oldest camp meeting in the country. It goes back to 1826, and um, took a break for the Civil War, but it still goes. It's 2,000 people, um, fresh sawdust every night. Uh, Alice and Becky pound out gospel hymns on big pianos. They have gospel choirs. Uh, people come from 10 states, it's huge, it's a, a, a whole week. And I was preaching there one night, and a, a, a disturbance occurred in the back, and people were screaming, and I had to, you know, we gotta stop, like what, what happened, what's going on? It's a squirrel, oh, is it Methodist or Presbyterian, you know? And it was hopping from people's shoulders and around, 
Yeah. Now, this goes back to people hear what they want to hear. Years later, I was walking through Reagan National Airport, and a guy came up to me and says, you, you preached at Salem Camp Meeting a few years ago. I, yeah, yeah, I did. And he says, you know that squirrel sermon you gave? It was great. <laughs> so you got to be, you know, you got to be flexible. You never know. People faint. Something might happen. But you never, you never give up. Um, okay, I am, I went way over. Sorry. You know, at least you didn't look at your watches too much. I really don't mind if you look at your watches, but when you take them off and shake them to see if they've stopped, you know, that's when I know I'm in trouble. Okay, I'm going to turn the lights back up, and I want uh, to see if anyone has a follow-up comment or question, because I'm not going back to sign books uh, this time. Uh, I will be tonight, but who's got a question, and I think somebody's going to have a mic are you all ready with the mics? Yeah, you're ready to run down with a mic. Here's one right here. Come on down, and I want to uh, hear what you caught. By the way, do you notice that I have newer tennis players now than, uh, than I? Okay, here we go. There you are. And then I think there was one right back here. Somebody raised one. But go ahead. You go first. Uh, I have two short questions. Okay. Uh, if a person is left-handed, does this reverse in the brain? No. I've heard it did. No. Okay. It has nothing to do with left-handedness or right-handedness. And the second is a comment. I was uh, told that Abraham Lincoln wrote that sermon on a brown paper bag. Yeah, there is a lot of um, apocryphal stuff about what actually happened and a lot of debates. Um, <laughs> and some say on a napkin. I mean, all different kinds of things. Uh, I, I find it kind of hard to believe that he wrote it on a brown paper bag, but, it, I, you know, I, I'm not there to testify, so I don't know. Uh, I'm of the tradition of that he wrote it before he got up there and then did a lot of editing. When you are a speaker uh, of any kind, if you're a, a you know, Bible teacher or you're a, a, a politician or a CEO, you edit right up. Now, if you're a J on the Myers-Briggs, you, you come to an end. I had a, a guy on my staff in Dallas who was a P. He was a P off the chart. And he was still rewriting his sermon as he stepped into the pulpit. You know? And I, I think if he hadn't had to give that sermon, he would spend the rest of his life rewriting a sermon, right? That's a little too much. But the truth is, I say this in uh, radio and podcast interviews about my novel, because it, it's... It's got 12 revisions. It's the 12th revision that good stories are not just written, whether it's screenplays or plays or poems, good books, whatever. They're rewritten. And so, you're, so I know a lot of testimony that he rewrote this several times and, and got it really tight. He was, he was just brilliant at it making presentations. There's just no question about it. And this, go back and read the Gettysburg Address again. It is, and any of these that I named, go read Queen Elizabeth's speech at Tilbury in 1588 to the English troops. It's incredible. Uh, read, read Kennedy's uh, speech to the Houston Ministerial Association. It is a speech that should be given today because of the divisions in our country. I think I saw, did I see someone with a hand back there? Yeah, we're right here, and then we got one toward the back. Yeah. Go ahead, right there. Thanks for those questions. Good questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those of us in the new middle age love paper and pencil. How does this translate to the younger generation that are using their cell phones? Y using their what? Cell phones. Oh, yes. Uh, you mean to make presentations using cell phones? Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of hard to draw the words and pictures on the cell phone. And it's hard to, um, it's, I think it's hard to make the presentation from a cell phone. Uh, I, I've tried a little bit, but if you can learn how to, the, 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 what I would do is try to teach them how to do it without the cell phone. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to do is, I've seen preachers with iPads, you know, they're up there with the iPad. And then the power goes off and Wi-Fi disappears. I'm like, what are you doing now? You know, you need to have it here. This is where you need to have your manuscript because anything can happen. I remember preaching in, uh, God, 
I, was, I started preaching in 1967, 18 years old, little town, Fairfax, Oklahoma. And I got up in the pulpit, and I didn't have my little sermon book like this at the time. I just had pages sitting up on the pulpit. And they hadn't told me, and I didn't notice it when I came in all of a sudden, there was a fan back there. And, and right before the sermon, they turned it on, and it went all over the congregation. And I said, who got page one? Let's just have a you know, collaborative sermon today, right? Well, that's when I stopped, when I realized anything can happen. You better have it up here if you want to get it out there. Yeah, so I, I would advise against the cell phones or the PowerPoint. I mean the uh, laptop or iPad or whatever. I'd advise against that as the way, just learn the thing, you know? And it's best to learn it from paper where you can draw on it and make circles and do all kinds of stuff. Okay, who else got a question? Somebody else? Yeah, back there, right there. Go ahead. Uh, some years ago, I was visiting my daughter in France, and I got the flu, the worst I've ever had. And so she took me to the emergency room, and there were so many people who had flu there, they were stopped elective surgery, and they were doing a triage, and they decided that they could send me to um, uh, where do you, uh, a place where you go to urgent care. And I was waiting in the waiting room, and I had a whiteout. My whole vision went white. Is that just what you're talking about, or yeah, is that it black? Was, that was a, well, it doesn't matter whether it's white or black. It's an occipital migraine. So what got it back for you? Well, I'm not sure. They took me by ambulance back to the emergency room and put me in. And I'm not sure what they did, and they never told me what it was, unless they told me in French. Uh, they probably gave you a Coca-Cola, and it took care of it. it That's what uh, happened for me. It may have, may have been, or maybe some red wine. But uh, yeah, yeah. The other thing, similar to, uh, I occasionally, when I'm exercising, get a looks like a glare, a partial whiteout, not the entire thing, and my. Ophthalmologist said, yeah, he gets those too when he's exercised, and he called it a, a visual migraine. Is that the same thing? Yeah, well, it's similar. Uh, it's just an occipital migraine. Well, it's all occipital because it all, the occipital region's right back here yeah. in the back of your head. Uh, but the, the point is, when it goes completely out, it's a much more serious thing as opposed to the little spots we get. And usually that's because you haven't had enough caffeine, you haven't had enough food when you're exercising and more intensely. More, more caffeine, yeah. sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> she says I should have less caffeine <laughs> in my Diet Coke, so I, I can eat a sugared Coke. Though. Well, you don't want to overdo it. That's, that's the other thing. Oh, that's you don't what want she too says. Much. Never mind. That's okay. <laughs> so I, I will. Are you, anything else you want to say? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, yeah, we, I haven't mentioned anything about diet, and I'll be talking tomorrow about, uh, tonight, excuse me, I'm lecturing again tonight, dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, I'll, I'll wait and talk about that later, diet related to that. Who else got a question? Yeah, got one there? Great. Is it on? Did it get turned off? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my Just crank it up a higher, a little bit higher. Go ahead. Um, I'm, my name is Isaiah Terry. I'm a junior here at Maryville College. Uh -huh. um, I just like to... Just kind of get my testimony right quick. Um, I just want to say thank you for the uh, beneficial um, information that you shared with us today. Um, recently, I uh, did my uh, grandmother's eulogy, um, and it was just a very uh, powerful moment for me. I'm a, a PK as well, uh, so it was kind of a more natural moment for me, but I just would like to stand and uh, just kind of tell you thank you for um, that information. It's definitely going to help me um, further my journey and what God's been laying out for me, so I just like to thank you. Good, for thank, you. thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. Any, anybody else? We're wrapping up here. Oh, you got a follow-up question here. Okay. Oh, so you're over there. I see. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll be quick, and this is very subjective. I know, in a room full of, I'm sure there's several pastors, but when you when you are were preaching, was there a certain time? that you felt like was the appropriate length of a sermon that it should be? Did you try to stay in certain prayer? How, how long is a good sermon? Or oh, how, the, how, or how, how long is a bad sermon? Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, I, lo I get this question a lot. That's, a, that's actually a very good question. And I, I, w I like to answer it this way. There are some people I don't want to listen to for more than a couple of minutes. That will be a long sermon. It depends on who it is and what they're saying. There are other people I could listen to for an hour. So there's no magic. However, I will say there are several things that are working in our world today that influence the question you just asked, the answer I would give. And one of them is 15 second, five second commercials. Everything is so quick right now. You cannot use a long Shakespearean quotation in a sermon anymore. You, you just can't do it. You have to summarize, you have to boom, you gotta keep it moving. You just, you just can't do it. I, I preached for 22 years in Dallas and I was a president at Pittsburgh Seminary for 10 years and then the last five years before we retired three years ago, from 2015 to 2020, I was senior pastor at Independent Presbyterian Church in Birmingham and Alabama. And, uh, you know, I, I'm one who believes you can do reruns and you can make them better. You know, you can warm them up. I mean, you, you can do them better. And I, I was stunned at how long some of my sermons in Dallas were. And people really liked them. They talked about how good, you know, but I was finding myself tightening them. So the sermons I gave more recently in Birmingham tended to be in the 15 to 18 minute range. They were 15 to 18 minutes. I rarely went over 20. Rarely ever. I, I'm sure you find that hard to believe because I kind of went over today. But the point is, when I'm giving a sermon, I'm keeping it tighter and, you know, I just want to get your attention from the first line and I want to keep, you, that's why I write a book. I want you, I want to grab you from the beginning and I want to keep you with me, right? As much as I possibly can. Well, the 30 minute takes longer to learn because it's just longer. Yeah. No, I, uh, and I did, by the way, I did all different kinds of styles. Sometimes it would be expository, verse by verse. Sometimes it was um, three points in a poem, you know. Um, you know, sometimes some passages open in three points in a poem. You know, the good, good Samaritan, beat them up, pass them up, lift them up. There you go, three points right there, you know. Uh, the prodigal son, sick of home, homesick, home, three points. Sometimes they open up in three points, but often they don't. So use, you, you may use a problem-solution a problem approach. And that's why uh, Peel and Schuler preach. Fosdick was the classic problem-solution preacher. Here's the problem in the world. The gospel is the solution. But sometimes for Fosdick, it was great art and great symphony. He was a kind of semi-Pelagian, you know, Fosdick. Great preacher, but you know, got to look at what he was actually saying in some cases. Uh, way better than McCartney. They had the big modernist controversy, uh, liberal controversy. Uh, and then there's um, Craddock. Uh, Craddock is basically like Halford Luckick at Yale. Halford Luckick told story after story after story and then it, the point. That's the inductive approach. That's what Craddock used. So I call that the Lecockian, Craddockian approach to preaching, right? Because it's story after story, and then you make the point. Now, I've seen a lot of preachers try to copy Craddock, and they, they, they fell apart. They, they just couldn't do it. Fred was a great friend. We were on the stage several times. Uh, I, I'm sorry he's gone. Uh, we were on the same platform, many uh, conferences and such. I'll, I'll never forget him uh, preaching at the Academy of North American Academy of Homiletics. So these are from Canada and you know, USA, all homiletics professors, all you know, wanting to show off how good they are and everything. And here's the great Fred Craddock. And he gets up, and it's a Saturday morning at Princeton and Miller Chapel. And you know he was short, so he's looking up over the podium, and he says, I don't usually do this on sun Saturday morning. I usually watch cartoons. He looks out and he says, hmm, characters look pretty much the same. <laughs> Took off from there. You can't be Craddock. 
you know, unless you're really, really good at telling those stories. Inductive approach, and then there's David Buttrick, who used the move system, where you move in and out of the text, and you take the congregation with you. It's a journey that you're taking through the text, and you have ups and you have downs, and you start off with something like, why did Jesus say this? I can't imagine. Well, maybe it was because of that. Or because of, well, no, I don't know if I could, you know, it moves in and it's, it's, it's a dialogue. So each move is a separate section. It's not points. It's different from three big points. You may have seven or eight moves in one sermon. You can do speeches this way too. Um, but it needs to be really clear when you're making a break to a new move because if you don't, you do start looking like you're meandering in a swamp and it's harder to follow. You understand what I mean by that? Yeah. So I find it easier to go stay under 20, just as a hard and fast rule for me. May not be for you. I, you know, that's you. What's that? That's what my wife wants. <laughs> that's what your wife. Well, you want your wife happy. I think that's important. Who else? Oh, you had another one. Follow up question. Here we go. Uh, any comments on the way our former president is able to manipulate people with his speeches? Oh my gosh. Uh, I want to really avoid getting into politics here. Um, well, he's not manipulating everybody. And, you know, he is not. Thank God for that. He is not. Um, and there are some, what is, a lot of studies on this. Uh, I wish Theodore Went, my old professor in presidential rhetoric, were still alive. He'd have a field day on, on, on this. Um, what, it, what he's doing is he's tapping into something that's missing for a certain group of people in the country that feel left out, and he has become their savior. And he can say almost anything, and they're going to like it. He is an entertainer. I just heard yesterday on the radio that um, somebody a analyzing him and DeSantis, and he says, you know, problem with DeSantis is he's just boring. There's no way he can compete with the entertainer side of Trump. Uh, you know, I, we could have a longer conversation. I don't want to do this on live stream, though. Uh, anybody else? I think we've run out of time. You all have been a wonderful audience, and we will go again tonight. It's tonight. It's exercising your your mind, your body, and your faith uh, for a complete and fulfilling life. This one, in this one, I'm going to mix something I've done at big church conferences on the marks of five marks of a live, active, and growing churches. If you're doing all five of these things, your church is growing. And I'm going to mix that with neuroscience. I've never done this before, so this will be the first time I've ever pulled this information together. And it's going to be kind of fun. Uh, yeah, I'll look. What's that? 7 o'clock. Yeah, 7 o'clock. And we won't do Q&A after because I'm going to sign some more books. Uh, the Assassin's Manuscript, not the, but Assassin's Manuscript. And uh, afterwards, and, but I'll answer any questions back there. You all are so kind to stay. Thank you for coming. We'll see you this evening. <laughs>